a few more participants are coming in, but let me start the meeting. Welcome to the uh, fall meeting of the San Francisco Division of the University of California uh, at its uh, fall meeting. Uh, I'm Stephen Chung, professor of otolaryngology, head neck surgery, and chair of the Division Academic Senate. The topic today is electrification of UCSF, an implementable local action to combat the difficult worldwide challenge of climate change, which possesses an existential threat to human survival. Let me begin uh, by sharing my slides. Before we go on with the program, I'd like to acknowledge the Ramatush Ohlone people who are the traditional custodians of this land on the San Francisco Peninsula. We pay our respects to the elders, past, present, and future, who call this place, the land that UCSF sits upon, their home. We're proud to continue their tradition of coming together and growing as a community. We thank the Ramatush Alani community for the stewardship and support, and we look forward to strengthening our ties as we continue our relationship of mutual respect and understanding. The agenda uh, for the next hour and a half or two will be an int introduction to climate change facts. This will be followed by speaker presentations. The keynote speaker is Norman Bay, and we have a number of folks from the university. This will be followed by a questions and answers session. Uh, my colleague, Chelsea Lanolin, uh, will be moderating that piece. I'll have some concluding remarks and I will request just one more minute so that you can provide feedback about our program today. Climate change is a human induced phenomenon 99% uh, of climate scientists agree. And we've seen evidence of this globally by September, 2021. The world was about one degree Celsius warmer than the 20th century average. Scientists have come together and have estimated that any global warming above 1.5 degrees Celsius or about 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit above the pre-industrial uh, average will have broad, serious, and perhaps irreversible consequences. Recently, the G20 has come together targeting about 2050 or about the middle of the century to achieve carbon neutrality and promising to end financial support for the building of coal plants. Coal is a major offender of um, greenhouse gases. But evidence acceptance is not yet universal and urgent action to mitigate climate change may be competing with installed base interests. About 140 elected officials of the 117th Congress rejected evidence of human induced climate change. The fossil fuel enterprises are profitable, nearly 2 trillion between 1990 and 2019. And recently, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce opposed President Biden's executive order to halt the Keystone Pipeline. Why do we care? We care because climate change impacts health. The most obvious is poor air quality, and that has respiratory consequences. But its implications for health are much broader. And in fact, as the climate warms, infectious vectors have a more favorable life cycle. And this would promote malaria, dengue fever, and many other maladies. It can even affect mental health as we understand that my forced migration and the chronic stress of climate change can cause anxiety, depression, and stress disorders. We, as a healthcare delivery organization, also impact climate change. And in fact, uh, we are major producers of unwanted hydrocarbons. 
California is a very big state. It is a leader both in energy production and in consumption. And the University of California is in the service of peoples of California and peoples of the world. Urgent actions are required to avert catastrophe, certainly within uh, the critical time frame of the next decade. The University of California has been very important uh, in energy research and can make defining contributions. With this, I'd like to introduce uh, our speakers. Uh, here is Norman Bay. Uh, Norman um, is a former chair of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission serving under the Obama administration and is now a partner in the law firm of Wilkie Farr and Gallagher. Norman has lived a life of an academic as a professor of law at the University of New Mexico and served as U U.S. Attorney for the District of New Mexico. Gail Lee uh, is the Director of the UCSF Office of Sustainability since 2010 and has worked tirelessly with many moving parts of our organization, including the Academic Senate, to work toward green buildings, carbon neutrality, sustainable foods, tox toxin reduction, um, water conservation, and our zero waste program. Next is uh, Adam Aron, who is a professor of psychology at the University of California, San Diego. Uh, Adam studies uh, forebrain inhibitory control of sensation perception, including pain. He is also a thought leader in measures to mitigate the looming climate crisis and has been a strong advocate for regional electrification of the University of California to take the uh, very early step to address, to, to address climate heating. And we have Paul Landry who recently has ascended to the role of interim director of engineering utilities uh, within the facilities management unit at UCSF. Paul oversees the production, procurement, and distribution of campus utilities, including water, steam, electricity, natural gas, and fuel oil. Uh, next is Raluca Scarlett, who is an assistant professor of nuclear engineering at UC Berkeley. She studies molten salts as liquid fuels for the next generation nuclear power generators uh, that may be developed to provide energy in a sustainable manner. Ruluka comes from uh, a department uh, that has been very active in this area. And in fact, the founding chair of her department was an influential member of the President's Commission on the accident at Three Mile Island in 1979. That, uh, that proposed and subsequently uh, implemented major changes in the licensing and in the operations of nuclear, nuclear power plants. Uh, here's my dear colleague, um, Chelsea uh, Lanolin, who is an assistant professor of health community systems. And she has been developing and implementing uh, models for integrated behavioral health care. Uh, she is the chair of the Committee on Sustainability and will be uh, taking uh, and will be um, moderating the speakers as well as the Q&A session. And with that, I will turn the mic uh, over to Chelsea. All right, hello everyone. Uh, so I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Norman Bay to uh, offer his uh, keynote. Please go ahead, Mr. Bay. Uh, thank you, Chelsea, and thank you, Steve. It's an honor uh, to be meeting with you, uh, your colleagues, and the other panelists to discuss uh, decarbonization and electrification. And in my 20 minutes today, I hope to 
uh, provide uh, some context for what's happening uh, nationally uh, with respect to um, efforts to decarbonize the grid. So I thought I would start first with a pop quiz question. So let's see the next slide. Um, and the question is this, compared to 2005 levels, uh, carbon emissions from the power industry in the United States in 2019 were 33% higher, 10% higher, about the same, 10% lower or 33% lower. So this is a question to try to determine who the energy geeks um, in the audience um, are today. Um, and the answer, and I think this is a surprise to most people, is that carbon emissions were 33% lower in 2019 from 2005 levels. Um, so that is definitely a step in the right direction. Uh, next slide. Um, so what I'd like to do today is to discuss the energy transition in the United States, um, what we have to do to integrate um, ever increasing amounts of renewable energy, um, and what we have to think about as we plan for the grid of the future and electrification. And clearly, efforts like those at UCSF uh, to create a microgrid um, can be part of the solution. Um, and next slide, please. So we're going through this period of really dramatic change. Um, and in 2020, renewables became the second greatest source of electricity in the United States. Um, so in 2020, about 40% of the electricity came from natural gas. 21% um, uh, came from renewables. 20% uh, uh, came from nuclear. And 17% came from coal. The brown line at the top represents coal. So you can see how coal has gone on this precipitous decline over the past decade, and while conversely, uh, more natural gas has been used. Um, the gas, however, has been produced through fracking. Uh, during the same time period, you can see how uh, renewables have increasingly been added uh, to the grid, while nuclear has remained relatively constant at around uh, 20%. Um, so currently in the United States, about 41% of our electricity is carbon free. Um, so so that's, that's good, uh, but clearly a lot more has to happen. All of which poses the question of how quickly the change could happen and how sweeping it could be. So let's see the next slide. There aren't any studies that try to project, uh, I think, how quickly the change could happen. But here's a very interesting data point to share with you. Um, and it relates to the Obama administration's signature effort to reduce carbon emissions from the power industry. In 2015, the EPA issued what was known as the Clean Power Plan. This plan um, sought to reduce carbon emissions from the power industry um, by 32% from 2005 levels by 2030. Right, so 15 year time period to get this 32% reduction from 2005 levels. Um, the clean power plant was never actually put in place. Why? Because the minute the EPA issued it, uh, groups opposed to the clean power plant filed uh, litigation in federal district court and got the, the clean power plant enjoined. So it never went into effect. Um, nevertheless, um, in 2019, um, the national target of the clean power plan was met towards the end of the Trump administration, which was an administration that very much favored fossil fuels over renewables. Um, so the national target was met 11 years ahead of schedule, even though the clean power plan never went into effect. And so this shows you the power of innovation, the economic forces driving the energy transition, the power of consumer preference at both the individual and corporate level, and the importance of state policy um, that helped uh, facilitate um, this change uh, from fossil fuels to renewables. Let's look at the next slide, please. So when you're talking about integrating um, ever increasing amounts of renewables, you basically have a menu of options uh, for doing that. And this is probably the best slide in this entire deck. Um, it was one uh, that was produced by the National uh, Renewable Energy Laboratory, otherwise known as NREL in Golden, Colorado. And on the horizontal axis, you can see the different options for integrating renewables. One, system operations. In other words, how you run um, your section of the grid. 
Um, another to the right, markets. And I'll talk about markets in a bit and why they're important uh, to California and to other parts of the country. Um, to the right of markets, load, uh, which is the uh, power industry's way of describing demand. Um, then flexible generation, which typically has been thought of as being fast ramping natural gas plants, whether they're combustion turbines or combined cycle plants. Um, the next option, networks or transmission. And I'll spend a little bit of time talking about that. And finally, energy storage, which is really an exciting development uh, to be seeing as the price of lithium ion batteries continues to fall. Uh, so those are essentially your options, system operations, markets, load or demand side management, flexible generation, transmission and storage. So let's look at markets first. Very quickly, um, these are the um, competitive wholesale markets in the United States. Um, on, the, on the West Coast, you've got the California Independent System Operator, also known as CAISO, which actually at this point now extends a little bit into Nevada. Um, to the East, um, you have uh, ERCOT, uh, which is in Texas uh, and which was in the news because of um, the response to Winter Storm Uri. North of ERCOT, you've got the Southwest Power Pool, otherwise known as SPP. Um, to the um, east of SPP, you've got the Mid-Continent Independent System Operator, otherwise known as MISO. Um, to the east of MISO, you've got PJM, which stands for Pennsylvania, Jersey, and Maryland, the largest regional transmission organization, or RTO, in the United States. Uh, north of PJM, you've got the New York um, ISO, or NISO, and then you've got um, ISO New England. These regional electricity markets um, not only uh, provide for the purchase uh, and uh, sale, uh, the purchase uh, and sale of electricity, but they also range the transmission flows within their respective footprints, um, and they do transmission planning. Um, so let's see why um, these markets matter to California. Next slide. One of the most um, exciting developments in the West uh, from a uh, electricity perspective is the development of the Western energy imbalance market. Um, this slide shows you how utilities across the West are joining this construct known as the EIM. Um, what the EIM is, is it's a real time energy market that allows for the purchase and the sale of electricity uh, to meet system need. Um, and um, so what it means then is that if you're in California and you need some electricity, um, you don't have to build another power plant. Instead, you can import that power from another uh, seller uh, in the West. Or conversely, if you're in California and you have excess power, you can sell it uh, to someone else in the West. So it facilitates all of those transactions in real time. Why does that matter? Because uh, for the system to maintain its reliability, supply and demand must always match. Okay, so that's, that's why it matters. So let's look at the next slide. In energy circles, um, this is an infamous diagram. It's known as the duck curve. What the duck curve portrays is that the, the load curve or the, the, the curve that portrays the demand for electricity throughout the day in California. And one thing you'll see is that in the morning hours, as the sun goes up, the load curve in California actually drops. Why? Because there are so many homes that have rooftop solar. Um, and then as the day goes on, as the sun starts to set, as people go home, there's a steep evening ramp beginning around 5 p.m. in the afternoon, at least in the winter time, and it's later in, in the summer. But you can see how. Um, um, you have excess generation during the day, um, and then you need a lot of electricity in the evening. Um, so the EIM allows California to basically sell excess generation during the day, but then to import uh, electricity um, in, in the evening when it's most needed. So let's look at some of the benefits of the EIM. If you can turn to the next slide, please. Um, so it has led to less renewable energy curtailment. Um, and it has saved consumers um, $1.7 billion since November of 2014. Uh, during the daylight hours, when you've got this cheap uh, solar energy in California that's not needed in California, 
um, other places in the West are only too happy um, to, uh, to get that power. And so that's the benefit of the EIM and the value of markets in helping uh, to make use of renewables and to integrate them into one system. So let's look at market rules. Uh, this area can get really complicated and technical, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it, but essentially the rules that you have that relate to transmission service and interconnection service can facilitate um, the use of renewable energy and ease the ability of renewables uh, to, to be interconnected into the grid. So these are, so these are very important um, and very technical uh, ways in which um, uh, markets uh, uh, and grid operators uh, can um, essentially uh, use the renewables. Let's turn to the next slide. Um, there is, um, um, let's, and this is flexible resources. Uh, and so um, I mentioned flexible resources earlier and the importance of flexible resources. One of the things that FERC has done over the last few years is to ensure that um, there is more uh, pr efficient price formations, that resources are valued for what they provide when they provide it. Uh, and so FERC has put in a place a series of rules that essentially compensate uh, flexible resources uh, for the support they provide uh, to the grid. Um, and uh, so, so that too uh, is an important part of uh, integrating uh, more renewables. Next slide, please. Then there's load or demand side management. Uh, the notion here is that during periods of peak demand, uh, perhaps you can give an economic incentive to consumers or to um, commercial and industrial users to dial back their demand. Uh, FERC has allowed DR to participate in the wholesale markets um, and the Supreme Court has upheld FERC uh, in a decision known as FERC versus EPSA, really a landmark decision uh, for, uh, for FERC uh, and for demand response. Um, so at this point in time, a DR a, can be one of the ways in which you integrate more renewable. So on the one hand, you can have flexible generation to, to add more electricity to the system, but then you could have demand side management that reduces uh, load uh, on the system. Uh, next slide, please. Then there's energy storage. Um, energy storage um, uh, is um, incredibly important to the grid of the future. Uh, over the last decade, in real terms, uh, the price of lithium ion batteries has dropped about 89%, uh, while the batteries themselves have become more energy dense. Uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance uh, projects that by 2023, EVs will reach price parity uh, with conventional vehicles that have internal combustion engines. And cheaper battery storage, even now, has allowed uh, battery storage to outcompete uh, what's known as gas peakers. These gas plants that are inefficient, that are expensive, that don't run more than a few hours in a year, better, but that are needed during periods of peak grid demand. Um, but battery storage can now replace uh, those gas peakers. And increasingly, what you're seeing on the grid. Um, is renewables coupled with storage. So you get solar plus storage, or you get wind plus storage. Um, and I would expect to see more innovation um, over the next few years as uh, tens of billions of dollars are being spent on trying to improve uh, storage technology. Uh, I think with a real focus actually now being on medium and longer term storage, uh, such as seasonal storage, i.e. what do you do if the sun doesn't shine uh, for like a week at a time, or the wind really does die down? for a prolonged period of time. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so storage has had problems entering the wholesale markets because it's not a conventional resource. It's not generation, it's not transmission. What is it? And so FERC tried to address that through a rulemaking known as uh, Order 841, a rulemaking that began when I was the chair of the commission. Um, and uh, FERC finally issued a rule, uh, which recently the DC Circuit upheld. And so now a lot of those barriers to participation by storage in the wholesale markets have been removed. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another, I think, very important flexible resource aside from storage is distributed energy resources, i.e. resources that are located at the distribution level, 
such as rooftop solar or a microgrid. FERC um, issued a rulemaking that began while I was the chair of FERC that now allows aggregated DER to participate in the wholesale market. So this is a very important development because it allows those resources to support the grid during times of peak need, um, but also gives those resources the ability to optimize their value so that if it's um, valuable uh, enough for them to offer those services to the grid, they have the ability to do so. Uh, so this too, it's, it's kind of still in an early stage, uh, but that potential is there. Uh, and so I think actually this is very, very helpful uh, for uh, microgrids and microgrid operators. Okay, let's turn to the next slide. So finally, let's talk about uh, networks uh, or transmission. Uh, clearly, uh, transmission can improve reliability and resiliency. It can provide economic benefit by alleviating congestion on the grid. Uh, NREL did a major study a few years ago called uh, the SEAM study that looked at building out high voltage transmission across the United States. They modeled four different scenarios. In every scenario, the benefits outweighed the costs. Um, and uh, you may ask the question then, well, why isn't that grid being built? And the reason for that is, I think, threefold. And these are interconnected issues. Uh, difficulties in the planning process uh, with cost allocation, because while people might recognize the benefits of transmission, no one wants to pay. And then siting, uh, because to site a major line, you've got to get permission from every state through which the line goes. Uh, and so building transmission is hard and it takes a long time, uh, which is, um, uh, and, and this is a slide that really uh, illustrates that point. Uh, here you have this illustration from the Bureau of Reclamation in 1952, uh, where they uh, tried to plan out uh, or plan a, a, a grid across the West, although ironically at the time this would have been for coal power. Uh, and there's this bold statement, such a power system will inevitably come. And of course, uh, 70 years later, uh, we're still waiting for that grid to be built. But now, of course, we want it to be for renewables, uh, since the most renewables rich parts of the United States are generally located far from the load centers or the big cities. Uh, so let's look at the next slide. The current chair of the commission, uh, Richard Glick, is acutely aware of this issue. Um, he has made building out transmission one of his top priorities. Um, and he's issued um, a series of rulemakings to try to improve transmission and interconnection policy um, and, and um, has sought to examine ways to incentivize uh, the development of more transmission as well as to incentivize the use of what's known as grid enhancing technologies. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So why does this matter? This matters because of electrification. Um, uh, just about all policymakers uh, believe that if you um, want to get serious about climate change, you've got to decarbonize the grid. And once you do that, you leverage the benefits of uh, the decarbonized grid um, through the rest of the economy. Uh, you start electrifying surface transportation, which at this point in the United States accounts for more carbon emissions than the power industry. Um, you start electrifying certain industrial processes. You start electrifying um, space heating. Um, and this study by NREL shows what uh, the demand for electricity would be under three different scenarios, a reference case, a median, uh, medium case, and then a high case. Uh, the key takeaway though is under any of those uh, scenarios, uh, there will be um, greater uh, need uh, for electricity. And so you, you need to build out the renewables, um, you need to build the transmission, you need to do other things that can enable uh, the grid of the future. And I know one of the other panelists will talk about nuclear and if you can get nuclear in there uh, in a cost-effective, reliable, sustainable way, uh, clearly that could be a part of the um, solution uh, set as well. Um, so uh, that's my presentation and look forward to taking any questions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Bay. That was very illuminating. Um, we will uh, save some questions for the uh, for the Q and A session later. Um, I'd like to hand uh, the mic to uh, Ms. Gail Lee. 
uh, please go ahead and provide your presentation. <clears throat> Thank you, Chelsea. So let me just share my screen. Okay. Um, so I want to thank the, the Steve and the committee for inviting me to present today. Um, so I want to get a quick overview of UCSF from 1990 to 2020. UCSF has actually grown from 5 million square feet to 11 million square feet. We added 15 new buildings and that was a 120% increase. But even then we have reduced our carbon emissions. And by the end of 2021, we'll have added an additional 1.2 million square feet. And during that time, we've implemented a lot of uh, energy efficiency projects and reduced our emissions to actually 3% below the target. Uh, we have a policy goal of achieving 1990 level emissions by 2020, and we did that and exceeded it by 3%. So it's quite remarkable the efforts that uh, we have put into that's attributed to a lot of the new construction have been very energy efficient. We've been working on improving efficiency in existing buildings. And the strategy that you, we worked with UC to develop, um, it, and I'll be talking about that later, but UC is leading the university <clears throat> in, in across the country and recently was recognized by EPA and their Green Power Leadership Program. But even so, to continue to meet our goal of carbon neutrality, uh, we need, really need everyone's help across the campus to help reduce energy demand, use our space more efficiently. And something recently we've recognized is that single use plastics um, are derived from fossil fuel products. And so if we can attempt to reduce our waste, to reduce our demand on fossil fuel products and um, shift to reusables, um, that would actually significantly help us. So I wanna go over, Oops, hold back. <laughs> I want to go over some terminology just to be sure uh, we're clear on what these emissions definitions are. Scope one is on site generation of emissions. So that's our PCUP, our Parnassus Heights Central Utility Plant. Um, any natural gas that we burn for heating, water heating, space heating, uh, heating, um, you know, even if for experiments, Bunsen burners. Um, and then our own fleet, which is the police, the shuttle fleet and any of the other vehicles owned by facilities and other departments. Scope two is uh, primarily electricity emissions and it's mainly PG&E, but I'll cover other sources of electricity that we purchase. And then scope three, which we're not going to be really discussing, um, includes business travel and commute emissions. Okay, so um, going, jumping to our climate policies, um, we did talk about it applying to all UC campuses and health systems. And for calendar year 2020 to 2024, the interim policy goal is to get back to our 1990 level emissions, including scopes one, two, and three. Starting in calendar year 2025, we do need to achieve carbon neutrality for scopes one and two. And that means getting um, to zero. And uh, we're looking at all possible ways we can do that. Okay, and, um, and really for calendar year 2045, there is a state law that requires that all campuses be carbon neutral for all scopes one, two, and three. So definitely commute and business travel will fall into that. So the carbon neutrality strategies, these were actually developed early on 2010, 2012, um, where we recognize that deep energy efficiencies were the most cost efficient way to reduce our energy demand. And then looking at transition from natural gas to all electric construction, brand new construction and renewal projects and renovation projects. Uh, the third strategy was biogas, where we would actually invest in capture of methane gas that has not been captured and released to the environment. And we invested in, in that as well as uh, at the last resort carbon offsets if we cannot achieve the goals by the deadline by those um, previous strategies. And then I will be talking about uh, what our reporting is for 2020 and future years 2021 to 2024. So for deep energy efficiencies, these are the things we're really looking at is retro commissioning, going back to look at all of our buildings to um, tune them up and make them run as they were originally designed as efficiently as possible. 
lighting retrofits, um, improving building automation control so that we can actually turn things down when people aren't in the buildings. Um, savings by design is a program required by UC policy, partnerships with our utilities for all new construction. So we focus strictly on energy efficiency for all new buildings. LEED certification actually doesn't guarantee that. So this savings by design program will require us to be building as efficiently as possible. Looking at motors, we have motors running equipment all over the campus. And if we can shift them to, instead of constant speed, to a variable speed, depending on usage and demand, we can save a lot of energy. And we're also working on a major project at Mount Zion to optimize lab ventilation, which is a, another motor uh, energy demand feature. And how do we optimize our lab ventilation to ensure that it's safe, but also save energy? And that's um, you know, looking back at looking at some of these automation controls. And also purchase of Energy Star products. So we look across the entire campus. Anything where we can purchase Energy Star with a huge difference. Um, we identified ultra low temperature freezers as a significant one. A, a, fish, a uh, conventional ultra low temperature freezer could use upwards of 35 to 40 kilowatt hours. And an Energy Star efficient one could use six to eight kilowatt hours a day. So that's a significant difference with just that shift. Clean energy and direct access. Uh, UC created a wholesale power company. We call it the UC Clean Power Program or the CPP. Um, they contracted uh, in installation of an 80 megawatt solar farm in the desert. That uh, 80 megawatts is split across the 10 campuses. And then they also are looking at direct or have already purchased directly renewable power from developers. And UC UCSF is purchasing that as much as possible. Um, and then the, that renewable power generated from UC is, is divided amongst the 10 campuses and we get about eight megawatts. But in 2020, UCSF actually received 38% of, of all of our clean power from the UC program. But there are other sources um, and I'll be covering those in a second. So if we look at electricity emissions as a percent of total, um, from 1990 to 2020, there's a significant drop from 28.8% to 7.7% of our total emissions in those 30 years. And that's attributed to several things, the UC Clean Power Program. We also buy hydropower from the Western Area Power Authority, um, the new um, CCA, Clean Power of San Francisco, and Peninsula Clean Power um, for Oyster Point. And San Francisco PUC is also selling us hydropower um, from the Hetch Hetchy system. And then we have on-site solar. So by the end of 2021, we anticipate 85 to 90% um, of our uh, renewable power will come from the Clean Power Program. And 98% of all of our electricity that we're purchasing is carbon-free um, by the end of this year. And this is a um, compilation of all of our on-site PV. Um, you can see we've been um, very active in 2018. We had a major contract with Goldman Sachs that actually purchased SunPower. So SunPower is managing those contracts, but it's owned by Goldman Sachs. Um, but these are all PPAs, power purchase agreements. They own um, the panels, they monitor, maintain them, and we purchase the power from them. And you can see um, San Francisco, the Mission Bay Hospital is the only, um, actually there's two that are owned by UCSF, that's the Mission Bay Hospital and the smaller system on the Aldea Community Center. But if you look at the total production, it's 2.7 megawatts of power. And another strategy is this transition from natural gas to electricity. So we are looking at new construction. Uh, the Thailand's housing is all electric. Uh, the Mission Bay Surgery Center and Clinic will be all electric. The new hospital at Parnassus Heights is we're really strongly pushing to make it as much electric as possible. It will be mostly electric with some surplus steam from the peak up for heating. And then we're transitioning non Parnassus Heights buildings um, from natural gas used for heating space and hot water to electric. And the new construction for uh, block 34 will be all electric um, using power from the SFPUC. And lastly, carbon offsets. So um, 
you know, when we talk about carbon offsets, we have a carbon offset task force that has been meeting for nearly over a year because it's a very complex, <laughs> uh, detailed discussion about how do we buy the right carbon offsets that um, align with our goals and our mission of advancing health worldwide and get high quality offsets that are CEQA compliant. Um, there's been a lot of discussion on that and we're, we're planning to make our final decision and recommendations on that purchase for 2020. But the, as I mentioned before, we have already met our 2020 goal of achieving exceeding our um, carbon emissions from in meeting our 1990 level emissions by this year. So we actually don't have to buy any carbon offsets this year. Uh, but we do have money and budgeted and set aside to do so that we can apply for future years. Um, another strategy is the biogas and carbon offsets. So um, UC purchased um, actually have contracts with two contractors to capture biogas. One's a landfill project, one's a dairy project. They capture the biogas, put it into a pipeline, and UCSF gets credit for that um, as zero carbon. And we've committed to purchasing 40% of our natural gas needs as biogas from UC starting in 2025. And if we mentioned the carbon offsets, um, we're only looking at high quality offsets being considered and we will be purchasing in 2020. Okay, and I don't take the, uh, any questions, we'll be at the end of the, in the panel discussion. Thank you so much, Gail, for that excellent discussion. Um, I'd like to pass this over to Professor Adam Aaron uh, for his presentation. Let's go ahead. Can you see that okay, Chelsea? Yes, we can see it. Okay, and you can hear me okay? Yes, yeah. thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for inviting me. It's, it's really exciting to see UCSF doing this. I think you're the first campus to really do something like this, talk about electrification so openly. It's wonderful. So my brief was to talk about university-wide response on the climate crisis, specifically to make some comments on carbon offsets, and then to speak about faculty activism for one minute. I'm here on behalf of the group electrifyuc.org, the UCSD Green New Deal climate justice movement. And I'm also in a campus climate change committee, the first of the 10 UCs at UCSD. So I wanna start with this uh, predictable picture of abject failure. I realize many people voted for these folks, <laughs> but you know, this is what Mr. Biden, Mr. Kerry looked like in Glasgow a few days ago. And of course they cannot uh, agree to internationally binding emissions cuts because all these countries, most of them are busy escalating fossil extraction. Mr. Biden has opened the pipeline from tar sands oil through Embry Street pipeline through to Northern Minnesota and he's escalating fossil fuel extraction on federal lands at levels not seen since George Bush. The Germans have just built a new pipeline from Russia and so forth. So why am I saying all of this? Because we need to do it here and we need to do it now. We need to get off the fossil fuels where we are locally in California in the great UC system and when that happens more, more around the world, it will percolate and then it will give the, the politicians the base to actually go for what we really need. Now, let's just, let's just revisit our predicament for a moment here. To have a 50% chance of keeping heating to two Celsius, okay, to two Celsius, we're gonna need about 5% emissions cuts per year from 2022 onwards. Had we started that in, in, 20, in, in, in the year 2000, we would only have needed 2%. So we're gonna need about 5% per annum starting in 2022, which is about half the emission cuts incurred under the pandemic, by the way. The, the 1.5 target is just simply nonsensical now, and many climate scientists will just confess that. They may not say it publicly. It's an absolute cliff. And the latest IPCC report makes quite clear that on the high emissions pathway, we're gonna blast through 1.5 as soon as 2030. So this is really what we need to do. We need to retire fossil fuel infrastructure right now, wherever we are. Unfortunately, our campuses have a major fossil fuel infrastructure. Gail showed the picture of the UCSF um, cogeneration plant. Um, just to point out, there's 10 campuses, as you know, seven of them have cogeneration plants, but all 10 are burning fracked methane gas for, for um, heat generation. Here's the, the plant at UCLA. I mean, this is a, this is a liberal progressive institution. Look at the size. This is fossil fuel infrastructure on the roof that we accessed with drone footage. Um, and UCLA is continuing to burn frac methane while buying, spending $300,000 buying offsets in states that don't have regulations so that biomethane can be fled over there. That's, the, that's their solution. I just wanted to share this picture to you today that I took 
at UCSD is absolutely flabbergasting. $1 billion of new buildings put up by our chancellor and here is a diesel plant adjacent to the new building spewing diesel fumes up into student dormitories and running as far as I can see day and night. This is not just emergency backup. So literally investing in new fossil fuel infrastructure right now in 21 in, 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 in this year. Now, the problem with the UC system is that the uh, sustainability uh, websites and the reports that the UCLP and President Drake sees and the Regents see are these glossy presentations that paint a positive picture, but we have accessed the truth of smokestack emissions using public records requests. And here is the actual emissions from our campus of scope one. This is the burning of frac methane plus the campus fleet. So the picture is pretty constant. There's certainly no decreases going on here. In fact, some campuses like UCL are actually increasing. UCSF is over here. UC San Diego is gonna be doing a major uptick since we've put up $2 billion of new buildings. So this is the truth, right? This is the smokestack emissions. This is over a million tons a year of carbon dioxide emitted from one of the most progressive institutions in the world. Now, my analysis, and I'm, I'm here, I believe, on behalf of the wider climate justice movement, on behalf of the biosphere, on behalf of the 18-year-old freshmen with tears in their eyes, on the behalf of the, the, the youth that are full of climate anxiety and those of us who care what's happening to our world, the truth is that carbon neutrality is a fiction. And so this is UC's plan, right? And here's a diagram taken from, from UC. Of course, it's not, slightly, it's not really inaccurate because emissions are not going down. But anyway, this is what they show. A million tons a year of CO2, scope one. And Gail referred to this earlier, dot, 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 dot. Whoa, we're gonna be carbon neutral by 2025. So we'll keep on burning frac methane at about emitting about a million tons a year, but some magic is gonna to happen to get us down there. Now, what is this magic? One part of it is biomethane, and I don't have time to elaborate that, but it's essentially functioning as an offset. It's full of problems. And the UC itself, its own report admits that. The second major component is offsets. And you know, this is, this is hard to cover in detail in a short time, but it's just, this is just morally preposterous, right? The notion that we keep emitting frac methane, which is highly toxic process to extract, which is damaging the biosphere, which leaks, which has a global warming potential 84 times worse than carbon dioxide, while we pay people somewhere else like this young woman over there in East Africa to use cook stove. It, it's probably not additional. In fact, it's almost impossible to know it's additional. It's a very good project in its own right because it's gonna improve the health and well-being of people in East Africa to not have smoky stoves. It will be funded anyway by the Europeans or the US government or philanthropy. It's very hard to say that it wouldn't have happened had we not paid for it. At most, it's going to balance our emissions. It's not going to lead to the emissions cuts we need, which are about 5% per annum in 2022 onwards, about 50% by 2030. And just look at the math, impossibly cheap. The UC's price for offsets is $7.50 a ton. So we emit a million tons of CO2. So that's $7.5 million. $7.5 million, the UC can take care of the whole problem. Well, let me tell you that before energy prices even went up recently, UCSD alone, one of the 10 campuses, is spending $10 million a year buying frac methane. And this doesn't account for the social cost of carbon, the damage to the biosphere, et cetera. So it's just preposterous to rely on this offsets logic. So what we did was we climate activists got to work. We generated a petition called the UC Energy Systems Petition. This came out of the UC, UCSD Green New Deal with our allies in the wider UC Green New Deal Coalition, which I was pleased to see was acknowledged as part of the motivation for this very electrification meeting. Um, the petition said we must make a, develop a fossil free energy plan in the UC, make plans, right? The question of where the money comes from is another question. Let's make plans now to get off the gas. Extreme weather hits California, 101 degrees, 121 degrees Fahrenheit. Extreme weather events increase 400%. UC emits a million tons a year of CO2. UC is culpable indirectly for climate aspects in the most vulnerable areas of the global south and in this country and directly culpable for toxic impacts of fracking in the Central Valley where our students families live in other frontline areas. We are running out of time. We have to cut emissions by 50% by 2030, but national and international governance has failed. We need grassroots action. We need to do this here. Sign the petition, please. So 3,500 people signed it. Many of you probably did as well as UC unions representing 50,000 people. This then led to a wider campaign known as electrifyuc.org and there's a website and you can learn all about these issues on that website. And if you know more than is on the website, please contact me and I'll add it. And I just wanna go over some of the, the headlines here and I'm gonna start at the bottom, okay? October, 2020, we did our energy systems petition, 3,500 signatures, I told you that. This triggered a number of meetings with chancellors and higher ups. For example, Chancellor Coase at UCSD, uh, the one at Davis and Berkeley and so forth. 
Uh, we also met with never President Drake himself, but one step down, EVP Rachel, Rachel Nava. Um, by about April that year, it was declared by the higher ups that President Drake, President Drake is not ready to abandon carbon neutrality to the 2025 goal. He thinks this is our goal for now and will stay as such. Meanwhile, our chancellor at UCSD allocated $250,000 for the first electrification planning, a wonderful thing. We're due to meet with him in two weeks to find out his disposition. Um, we did the public records request and got the truth about the smokestack emissions, which is otherwise impossible to glean. Um, we published an expose in the Sacramento Bee about what offsets purchases of Hope 5 actually consisted in, which is absolutely scandalous, like buying biomethane, paying for biomethane in places like Louisiana to be fled. But we keep emitting CO2 at UCSD and the other campus, UCLA, burning frack methane, and we pay for biomethane to be fled in another state, okay? Uh, we have um, uh, now got this uh, electrification thing here, and I'm, I'm good news to announce is that Berkeley has found a million dollars to proceed with its first electrification study to really see what it would take to get off the gas. So uh, my last slide here is just to say, I was asked to speak to this, what's, what specific things can faculty do? And there's two main things you can do, faculty. So first of all, I would say jump into grassroots organizing, get with your students and staff at UCSF and get ready to protest. Why do I say get ready to protest? Because this ain't gonna happen without it. There is no way in hell that the higher ups and our chancellors are willingly gonna suddenly come up with hundreds of millions of dollars to re retire fossil fuel infrastructure early with lost value unless they are impelled and forced to do so. Secondly, work within your Senate. Um, the Senate really can accomplish some good things. We developed a task force on climate crisis report uh, with 35 concrete recommendations, including banking, transportation, all sorts of issues. And this led to the formation of a campus climate change committee. There is something like this at UCSF already and, and congratulations to you for moving that forward and putting on this, this event today. I just wanna say though, that there's real value in having an actual Senate standing committee and to get that on all 10 campuses will solidify us, will give us representation with the regents and the UCLP, President Drake. And in our, the, the, the short 10 months of the existence of our committee, we've got a fossil free resolution approved by the representative assembly, i.e. the faculty saying we have to retire fossil fuel infrastructure this decade and go renewable no new fossil fuel infrastructure, although it's obviously too late for that one building I just showed you. We have got commitment for a 30,000 undergrads to have climate crisis or climate change related education that's not yet implemented, but it's agreed to. We're developing conflict of interest resolution. UCSF uh, developed uh, tobacco policy uh, 2309, Regents policy 2309 on tobacco. So we need conflicts of interest resolution because our campuses are awash with fossil dollars and a lot of the resistance, by the way, to getting off the gas and moving to electrification. And Norman was very polite not to mention that there are enormous vested interests that are opposing the shift to electrification, including in our campuses. And that's partly linked to enormous amounts of fossil, fossil dollars being donated for research and so forth. Um, I also finally want to mention here that, um, you know, we have a focus now on transportation. The emissions from transportation are about 50% as much as the ones from cogen and campus fleets, like enormous amount, for aviation and ground transportation. We are burning frack methane in our buses at UCSD hundreds of times a day. Um, and then there's major issues about the banks we're using. We're using like the worst banks. Our main bank is Bank of America, funded the climate crisis to the tune of $200 billion over the last three years. Tar sands extraction, drilling. Why are we using Bank of America? We could be shifting to something else. So I will stop there and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Arun. Um, I'd like to hand the mic to Mr. Paul Landry. Please go ahead. Great. Well, thank you, Chelsea. And thank you everyone for having me here. I'm very excited to be here and talk about um, carbon neutrality and, and what things we can do today. And that, in that regard, um, it's one of my favorite topics. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Paul Landry. I'm the Director of Engineering and Utilities. And I do energy conservation, uh, building automation, and uh, uh, lead the professional engineers group here at UCSF. So I thought, um, since our first topic was more of a uh, US-wide topic and then Gail's topic was a UCSF topic, I would narrow it even further a little bit. And um, thank you for time. And I wanted to talk about how we're gonna reduce emissions as part of the steam to hot water conversion. Um, I'm going to 
going to share my slides here. Okay. Someone chat me if I don't have that in uh, presentation mode. But one of the questions we get asked a lot is with this. Just a second. Can you? I just want to confirm that I'm in presentation mode. In chat. Yes, no? Yeah, Paul, it looks like we only see half your screen. Okay, great. That's important to know. Um, give me one second. Okay, how about now? Good. Better, yes. Okay, so, um, so I'm gonna talk about specifically our transition, uh, how we're gonna deal with heating and at Parnassus. We're on schedule to add two large projects, the PGRAB project, which is a research building, and a new hospital at Parnassus. So um, our question is really, can we drive the emissions of these two items down? And so Parnassus being one of our main campuses just uh, is a hundred years old and it's an urban campus, it's vertical, it's fed by a steam system that is fairly efficient. But the question is how do we convert that into a way, how do we transition away from that so we don't need to use steam and so we can use lower carbon heating systems. And that's, that's a really tough one. We've been looking across the nation at other campuses that are in the same um, situation, particularly urban campuses and older campuses. And we, we have some developments that are happening, the new hospital and the West Campus development. So what we wanna do with those projects and uh, is we wanna maximize as much as we can, setting up, not just reducing, using the minimal amount of new resources, but also setting ourselves up for the future. So. What I'm going to share with you, um, the hospital project is, is well underway as far as the design. The PRAP are actually just starting out. So, Oops. and this is what the new hospital will look like. So, significant increase, almost a 30% increase in square footage. So, what we want to do is maximize heat recovery and system efficiency. And we want to open our system up to other low carbon heating technologies. We want to install infrastructure so that the plant can eventually be replaced with lower carbon heating options. So one of the, some of the key things to do that is we need to have all the new buildings be designed to use low temperature heating and not steam. Um, and then we need to establish some low temperature heating, what I'm calling nodes, which just means um, the pipes and the highway to get that heat from building to building and then maximize heat recovery and system efficiency. So these are our two development sites, um, the hospital and West Campus. So right now the hospital is already on track to be designed to use low temperature heating, um, has a heat recovery chiller in it that's gonna, uh, under the current design, that's gonna take heat that's used in MRIs and, and um, scanners and then dump that heat into the heating system offsetting what would have been carbon uh, or burning gas and it's also we found there's an innovative way to capture additional waste off the central plant and heat that so um, some really exciting stuff is happening with that and then as i said PRAB is just starting but we're, we're very um hopeful that we'll get some some really good efficiency and design out of that one so why low temp heating hot water? It mostly, uh, I'll talk about heat recovery chillers in a second. It allows the use of heat recovery and it can both, a lot of times people will say electrification is expensive and it can be expensive. There, there are several technologies that cost quite a bit and are somewhat prohibitive, but if it's done right and you can capture the waste heat, some, you can actually save money and electrify in a lot of cases. So this is what, um, is one of the technologies we're looking at actually for Mission Bay and for two of the projects that are happening here. And what it does is if anybody has seen an air conditioner, even your window air conditioner, 
what it does, it makes something cold and it exhausts the heat out. And so on big campuses like this, we're making cold water to cool the buildings and we're typically exhausting all that heat out to a cooling tower where it just goes to atmosphere. So what, th what this does is instead of blowing that heat out to atmosphere, we, sit, we capture that heat and we're able to reuse that heat into the system. So anytime we're making cooling stuff, we can also be adding to the heating of the campus. And because, I mean, that won't solve all of our heating needs, but it can take a big chunk out of the carbon. Because when, even if that just offsets, kind of highlighted here, the times of day when we're both heating and cooling, it's a big opportunity for us to reduce energy. Um, and then, as I said, it opens us up to use um, all these new technologies, not new technologies, but many of the technologies surrounding electrification and also things like solar thermal, they have a really tough time making very hot stuff, but they can make moderately hot stuff. So if your building can be heated with 140 degrees or less and it's designed that way, that really opens up the system to take in you know, geothermal heating, um, air source heat pumps, taking heat off of data centers, all these things that really in, both improve efficiency, but also reduce carbon. So um, this is the central plant. You can see that it discharges air out to the stack at about 320 to 450 degrees. So part of the hospital project, we are just going to tap into that and draw that heat off of there, and use it as heating for the new hospital. So without any additional gas use, we'll be basically capturing that heat, putting it towards the new hospital. And that will be able to provide a lot of the heat with no additional gas use and no um, additional electric use. So it's a really um, innovative project and will save a lot of uh, energy and carbon. Um, at Mission Bay, same thing. Uh, we're, 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 we have a study underway to add a heat recovery chiller at Mission Bay. Um, most of the development is at Parnassus over the next couple of years, but when Mission Bay has its next round of development, we think we might be able to put, excuse me, um, thermal storage so that sometimes when we can, we have that imbalance of heating and cooling, we can store some of that heat or store some of that cooling to, to, more, uh, to reduce more emissions. Um, and I think that's pretty much my timeline. I mean, my, my five minutes, sorry. So I want to thank you and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, I'd like to pass to Professor Berluca Scarlett. Please go ahead. So hello everyone. Thank you very much for the um, for the invitation to speak. My name is Rebecca Scarlett, and I'm an assistant professor in nuclear engineering at UC Berkeley. And I work on um, the next generation of nuclear reactors. I think about reactor design and reactor safety. Um, and um, and actually, this semester I'm teaching a class on thermodynamics, and I've been reflecting a lot on how uh, the conventional way of teaching thermodynamics we often focus on. Um, fossil fuel combustion and how do we convert that from thermal heat into mechanical heat and ultimately into electrical heat. And so it's time to, to, to update maybe how we teach thermal so that we also talk about climate adaptation and these questions of heat integration, how do we use heat pumps so that we can electrify heating and cooling and so on. So thank you for that, um, for that presentation. Um, I've, I've certainly I've certainly seen a lot of interest also from the students in, in discussing these topics. Um, so what um, what I'm going to talk about for five minutes is nuclear energy and what role does nuclear energy play in terms of electrification and storage and so on. So I think in parallel to um, having more options for energy storage and in parallel to electrification we also need to consider what is the energy source of that electricity that we now are going to use for our electrified heating systems and cooling systems and energy needs. Um, and nuclear energy is one of the options. Um, and um, I, 
I'm going to lay out the arguments for nuclear energy. Now, I am an academic in nuclear engineering, and my job is to be, of course, critical of, of the field. So I have plenty of, of opinions also on, on how nuclear energy could improve, but that's not the topic of this talk. Uh, the topic of this talk is why is it worthwhile to include nuclear energy in the conversation about energy sources? And so just to put things into perspective, um, lifetime CO2 emissions per capita in the US is about 660 ton of CO2. Uh, as a point of con comparison, we exhale about 36 tons of CO2 just from the food that we eat. We eat about a kilogram of food a day, so we emit about a kilogram of CO2 just from exhaling. Um, so 18 times that would be what um, we release as atmospheric waste per capita. And so what if uh, we instead look at nuclear energy, what would be our lifetime waste produced by nuclear energy? Um, and it's about six kilograms. Um, I was looking for something that weighs about six kilograms. Turns out that a four month old poodle weighs six kilograms. And so um, that would be um, the amount of, um, of solid waste that the entire nuclear fuel cycle will, would produce uh, per lifetime per capita. And that includes not just the fuel, the nuclear fuel that is utilized, whether it's uranium or thorium or something else, but it also includes all of the soil displaced. Um, if, um, if it's an open pit uranium mine or if it's a thorium mine um, and, and so on. So, Kind of integrating all of the externalities of the nuclear fuel cycle, you end up with six kilograms of solid waste, which is obviously managed very differently from atmospheric waste. And it's five orders of magnitude, or more than five orders of magnitude. Um, um, sorry, excuse me, eight orders of magnitude. Um, smaller than the waste produced by fossil fuel. And the reason that this is the case is that nuclear energy, whether it's fusion or fission, uses the energy that is stored in, uh, in the nucleus of an atom. Whereas anything that has to do with chemical energy, so combustion, for example, will use the energy that is stored in the surrounding cloud of electrons. So the energy density of, of nuclear energy is much higher, um, in orders of magnitude um, higher than the energy density of, of chemical reactions. And so this is, I think, a strong motivation um, to include nuclear energy as part of the conversation about where is the energy going to come from um, once we have electrified and we have included energy storage and um, we have done energy integration, the electricity that we still need at that point, where does it come from? And I think nuclear energy needs to be part of that conversation. Uh, today in the US, this is what sort of the profile looks like with nuclear power having been flat over the last few decades. Um, in the US, there are for about 450 power reactors operating in 31 countries, a total of 390 gigawatt electric installed capacity. Um, and then um, there are a number of reactors that are either planned or under constructions. Uh, with China having the largest number of reactors currently planned or under construction, um, and then the U.S. having um, not very many. Uh, this is where our current um, nuclear power plants exist in the U.S. Uh, this is a map uh, showing uh, a number of things. It shows a 10-mile um, emergency planning zone, and it also shows the 50 mile zone um, around the nuclear power plant, which is monitored for um, soil and water contamination. Um, and it also shows in red numbers the age of the plant. So interestingly enough, all of our plants in the US are quite old, um, 40s, their 40s. These are very old plants that will, in some cases, be extended to a longer lifetime, maybe 60, maybe 80, but many of them will decommission. Um, and, and so the question will be, what will replace them? Will it be fossil fuel that replaces them? And these are very large plants. These are one gigawatt plants. So that's a lot of fossil fuel coming online if, if that's what will replace them. Um, so we, um, this is a conversation. Again, nuclear needs to be part of the conversation. Um, to look at 
Uh, the his a little bit more at the history in 1966, we were just starting to build plants, 1973. Um, we had built a few in California and most of them on the East Coast. And by 1985, we had stopped building all of the plants that we were going to build. So um, from 85 to 2014, not a lot of differences except um, decommissioned plants. So we've decommissioned quite a few. And so the question is, if we think that nuclear can play a role in decarbonizing our energy usage, how would nuclear grow? <clears throat> and I think um, because we haven't built nuclear power plants in a while, there's an opportunity here to say, how can the technology change and should the technology change from what we were building 40 years ago? Um, and um, there's also a challenge in that we haven't built plants in 40 years. And so relearning how to do that and redeveloping the infrastructure for building nuclear power plants is definitely a challenge. Um, and then uh, there's the question of why hasn't nuclear grown? Um, and I, I think my personal opinion is that the reason is cost. Nuclear is just too expensive or has been too expensive to compete with natural gas. Um, and so that's, that's the reason, cost, it's too expensive. But then if we look at the current, um, the current situation, there is an ecosystem of startup companies that are looking to develop new nuclear energy technology. And this is private capital being invested in, this is a, just a subset of startup companies to give you an example. And so there's private capital being invested into these technologies. And most of these technologies are, are not um, water-based technologies. So the map I showed you before, all of those are water-cooled reactors, uh, basically uh, big steam pots. They produce steam and the steam runs, uh, run the turbines. Um, and so those plants, um, are very expensive to build today for a variety of reasons. Um, and if we look at the startup companies in nuclear energy today, most of them are moving to new types of nuclear power plants that use, for example, liquid salts, molten salts, or use gas as a coolant, or use liquid metal as a coolant, so that um, instead of water, which provides a pressurized system, um, you can use, for example, a salt um, a, a salt coolant that, that does not provide any pressure, so you can run it with an op open pot and, and, and manage the risk of dispersing radionuclei radionuclides in a very different fashion than, um, than if we have a pressurized system. Um, and so then one might say, oh, this is great. It sounds like nuclear power plants that we, would, we can build today would be much safer because, for example, they wouldn't be pressurized. Uh, but I would say that that is not a correct statement uh, or not necessarily a correct statement because if we look at how nuclear reactors are licensed, um, we typically think of risk in terms of consequence and frequency. So we have frequent events and their consequences um, are, are regulated by um, the Code of Federal Regulation 10 CFR 50.20. Um, and then events that are uh, rare, so once um, in, in 100 years, um, are regulated by 10 CFR Part 50.34. Um, but the point is that um, all nuclear power plants, no matter what the technology is, um, is regulated to the same regulation. So it has the same level of safety that is being um, regulated and applied. And these bounds are not defined by the technologies. They're defined by society. Society has decided that everything to the left of these bounds is acceptable risk, and everything to the right of the bounds is not acceptable risk. And then the role of the technologists that develop and commercialize nuclear power plants is to prove that, um, that the reactor will not exceed these bounds of acceptable risk. Um, so when we set out to develop a new technology that maybe will be cheaper, um, it's not that the technology will be safer, but it's that it will be cheaper to demonstrate that the, rea that the technology is just as safe. Um, and so, if, um, so again, it goes back to cost. Yes, there are inherent features into, say, salt, 
salt power plants that make them inherently safer. So then that is used towards um, uh, a faster commercialization timeline so that uh, it takes us longer to prove the safety of salt reactors. Uh, sorry, it takes us shorter to prove the safety of these types of reactors. And then it's also used towards um, resource, um, minimizing the resources that, it's, that are required to license such a reactor. And so then that makes them cheaper in the end. Uh, and so in summary, the resource utilization is five to six to eight orders of, orders of magnitude, depending on the type of plant. Uh, lower for um, energy that is based on nuclear reactions versus energy that is based on chemical reactions. Um, and then there's a wide range of nuclear technology that is available and that can be commercialized. Um, and so this includes large, large reactors, small reactors, um, capability for power peaking, um, so it's not just base load. Um, black start, so if the grid is off and you need power, instead of running your backup diesel generator, you can have um, a reactor that, that provides that black start capability and running on a black grid. Um, they can be located in low population zones or they can be designed to be located in the high population zones. They can be built on a ship or they can be built on the ground under the hospital. Um, they can be remotely deployable. So if there is a region that has been um, devastated by uh, a natural phenomenon, then maybe a reactor can be deployed there without the need of a grid or additional infrastructure and is more compact um, than, than having to ship a lot of fossil fuel over there. Um, also reliability. Um, nuclear power plants can be designed to operate with really high reliability. Um, higher reliability than coal plants or gas plants or diesel generators. Um, and then they can provide services other than energy. So they can provide heat, they can provide process heat, they can provide medical isotopes. And so all of these capabilities for nuclear technologies now creates a new ecosystem of startup companies in nuclear that are looking to meet this diverse energy market uh, that is compat compatible with nuclear technology. Um, and then the other point that is important to make is that the social technical dimensions of nuclear energy are a necessary element of nuclear technology. The acceptable risk is defined by society, not by the technologists, and then the technologists meet the acceptable risk, risk goals that are set by the society. And this is verified and monitored by an independent um, regulatory agency. Um, so necessarily that this is one example of the social technical dimension of nuclear energy. Um, which is, which is um, um, I think in, in other technologies, it's maybe an afterthought. The social technical dimensions um, are an afterthought. We realize later that um, maybe consideration should have been given, but in, in nuclear energy, it is, um, it is just as central as safety analysis. Um, and then challenges, the cost, can we make nuclear energy competitive with, um, natural gas um, and the time to deployment, how quickly, if we wanted a salt reactor today, can we buy it? Um, and what does today mean? Does it mean next year? Does it mean in two years? Um, and that's connected to infrastructure development. How do we build new fuel, um, new fuel plants, nuclear fuel plants um, and workforce development. Um, and I'll end with making one more comment on cost. Um, I think Part of the challenge to cost is similar to the example that was given about electrification uh, or heat integration. Maybe heat integration is an even better example because with heat integration, there's an initial investment that we make in the equipment. Um, and then after the initial investment, uh, there is no, there's no additional energy consumption cost. So there's no additional fuel cost. Um, but making that decision to make that initial investment um, is, of course, challenging because it's expensive. And so it's, it's a similar challenge with nuclear energy as well, as well. Because the cost of the fuel is low, a lot of the costs uh, will go up front into the, com the licensing, the commercialization, the construction of the plant. And so um, it'll be interesting to see how how all of the startup companies, some of them in California, 
um, will we'll manage this challenge. Uh, um, and again, thank you very much for the invitation to come talk about nuclear energy. All right, thank you so much, uh, Professor Scarlett. Um, so we're going to transition to the Q and A uh, portion of this uh, of this uh, meeting today. Um, we'll start out with uh, some some questions that that we prepared, and we'll transition to uh, questions from the audience. A bit of a mix. Um, so this one um, is addressed to uh, Mr. Bay. So while FERC regulates electric uh, transmission rates and facilities. Um, although not necessarily their siting and their construction, um, state and local governments generally regulate the electric distribu distribution system. So that that's like the hundreds and thousands of miles of lower high lower voltage lines that provide power to homes and businesses, and the electric utilities that own and operate these facilities. This division of authority over the electric grid can create regulation between states and localities and the federal government, especially as the federal government seeks to promote new technologies such as smart grids and distributed energy resources and to expand its authority over electric system reliability. So my question to you is what is the dynamic between California, California laws and regulations and federal regulations with respect to the electric transmission grid and its current and future growth? That's a great question because inherent in the way in which the Federal Power Act uh, provided uh, for authority for FERC was the very tension that you described. Um, the FPA um, gives FERC jurisdiction over a transmission and the wholesale markets, and it gives states jurisdiction over the distribution system in retail. And where the tension has arisen is that as FERC has tried to promote the use of um, demand response of aggregated distributed energy resources that are aggregated at the distribution level like DR, but offered into the wholesale market when the, when the, the need is there. Some states have not liked that at all and have opposed those rulemakings. Um, and that's what the Supreme Court case uh, in part was all about, that is FERC versus EPSA. But so far, FERC has been winning that battle in the courts and has gotten support from uh, states that are more supportive of clean energy. And California is one of those states. So California has not been opposing those big FERC policy initiatives. In fact, California and FERC have been on the same page there. Um, so, so I would say it probably depends upon what state you're, you're looking at. And indeed, I would say some of the rules from the California market, the California ISO, uh, were used by FERC as a thought about what the rule should look like for energy storage and distributed energy resources. Um, so I would not say that there is never tension between uh, FERC and California. Certainly there was um, decades ago during the Western power crisis. I'm, I'm happy to say that nowadays, I think both FERC and California seem to be on the same page. Um, the difficulty you can also have, so another complication is when you're talking about siting transmission infrastructure, sometimes it's not even states that have the say, it can be local authorities like counties or, or cities, and so it can get very, very complicated, uh, but, but this tension is built into the very structure of the Federal Power Act. Thank you very much. Um, would any of the other panelists like to comment on this? Okay, we can go to the next question then. Um, so this question is for all panelists, um, but we can start with Gail since you mentioned it in your presentation. Um, so the UC biomethane program is different from the offsets uh, bought by Merced and UCLA, um, open flaring of landfill gas in other states such as Oklahoma. Um, the uh, quality of the former is unquestionably far greater than the latter and open question is whether these programs serve to justify continuing to power our campuses with fossil gas. How do you see the role of carbon offsets in the fight against climate change? Gail, you're Sorry, I, was, I, I need to unmute myself. So it's a good question. Our carbon task, our offset task force has been um, discussing 
these issues around quality of carbon offsets, um, additionality of carbon offsets, <clears throat> those that are um, acceptable by the California Environmental Quality Act in California to make sure that we are um, selecting offsets that meet the highest standards. Um, and generally the third party certifying agencies um, that certify carbon offsets have not been as rigorous as we would like them to be uh, with regard to um, re reforestation or tree planting um, projects that don't guarantee that the trees will be protected uh, into the future and that their, their future um, carbon sequestration is guaranteed. So sometimes we have to look at um, you know, how good the quality of, of those offsets are. And we do have a, uh, an expert working with the Office of the President to identify the highest quality offsets. We also recognize that it's not an ongoing strategy. We're looking at it as an interim strategy um, because we realize that we can't turn on a dime to switch completely to what we're currently doing to zero carbon. Um, it's gonna take time, infrastructure changes, new construction uh, transition from natural gas to all electric. Um, so in the interim, we're looking at the carbon offsets just as a bridge um, to, to get to that point. But there is a, um, a state law that's requiring us to get to carbon neutrality uh, without offsets by 2045. So we do have a target down the road to um, not rely on carbon offsets. Thank you very much. Um, any others that would like to comment on that in the panel? I just echo what Gail said that we, we I think it's really a bridge because there may also be um, some innovation that happens now that just by having a carbon market, having to pay for offsets that um, the, the, hopefully that spurs more innovation and more things that whether it be carbon capture or hydrogen or a lot of these things that are talked about that are not real yet um that maybe that will push some of those things by having to pay for carbon thank you please uh dr Arn. yeah hi um i mean my impression is very few sustainability officers actually believe that offsets are a strategy at all and so they seem you know impelled to keep talking about this with without much conviction and I mean, it's really not complicated. Let's make plans to electrify the campuses like next week and uh, make those plans. It might take a year and then transition to finding the dollars to get off the gas. I mean, if we take seriously the imperative to cut emissions by 50% by 2030, about 55% per annum starting 2022, there's no time to delay. We need to recite the fossil fuel infrastructure. I don't understand the logic, Gail. Maybe you can explain more about this bridge. It's too soon. Uh, we, we can't go to zero, no one's saying go to zero carbon tomorrow, we're saying cut emissions, the, the IPCC and all the world's governments have basically said we have to cut emissions by 50% by 2030. Why is this fig leaf of offsets absolutely insisted upon and why don't you all just start, start telling the truth about this, like right now? You know, we will no longer, David Phillips and Gail and everyone else, we will no longer advocate offsets, we'll tell President Drake we don't believe in it anymore. And wouldn't that be tantamount to now facing the serious transition that Norman Bray has laid out is actually happening? <laughs> the shift to renewables is actually happening at pace, at scale. Why can't the UC get with that right now? That's what I want to know. Thank you for laying that out. Um, Gail or Paul, would you like to respond? Well, I would say that the California electrical system is a very much dynamic system and we're in a transition right now. Um, I think the integration of renewables and the, uh, the things that we've seen in the last year, PSPS outages, rolling blackouts for the first time in 20 years. Um, to tie it into Luca's uh, presentation, you know, when we decommission these nuclear plants that are one gigawatt, in, in some cases, we're starting up new gas fired plants to make up a difference. And I think if you look at it as a whole system, there, there's a lot to it. And um, in some cases, that there's, there's actions that you don't intend to happen that also happen. 
Yeah, and uh, I, I agree with Paul. Um, and and to Adam's uh, comment, I think we because the UC policy uh, dictates that we achieve carbon neutrality. The only way we can do it is through carbon offsets. If they um, decide to back off on that and tell us to focus on, you know, shifting all those all that funding and getting rid of these targets then we can shift our focus. But because the way the part policy is written to comply with it, that's what we have to do. Thank you, Gail. Um, so there's a related question from, from the audience. And I do want to point out um, if uh, those folks who have their hands raised, if you could kindly um, enter your questions via the Q&A, that will enable us to get to those. Um, we have a question from Stephen Wheeler. Um, is UCSF studying all electric construction of its new buildings and conversion of existing buildings? The presentation emphasized various efficiency improvements. Excuse me. Um, uh, but not basic choices of fuels. Um, seems like the all electric option should be driving the discussion. Yes, well, the new buildings that we're designing right now, uh, we're definitely looking at that. So block 34, the uh, surgery center and clinic on um, um, that's on, on Third Street is slated to be all electric. Um, the Tidelands is two housing buildings that's all electric. We're looking at uh, Aldea Housing to increase the number of housing units um, up at Aldea, and that is all slated to be all electric. So it's definitely, uh, even the new hospital, we're looking at every different angle that we can to make it all electric. And any new construction going forward, um, we're looking at lead gold and um, continuing to focus on how we can make it all electric and not rely on natural gas at all. So going forward, we see that for new buildings, but for existing buildings, it's that transition um, that Paul talked about uh, that's, that's gonna take time but we do have a plan that's looking directly at those issues. Um, I have a question for, um, for Paul. Um, hospitals, research labs, universities, they use a tremendous amount of energy producing substantial greenhouse gas emissions and contributing to the climate crisis. However, the need for reliability um, is paramount in a hospital setting or a laboratory, something we have to consider as a campus. Um, how do we balance the need for decarbonization with the need to power the campus? And that is a really one that's really come to light in the last year. You know, as we've had these, um, the reliability of the grid has really shown itself to be less reliable than it has been in a very long time. Um, and we have, you know, we, we have some research on this campus and some health care activities, clinics, surgery, all kinds of things that we just can't afford to lose. So reliability is absolutely an important thing. Um, so, yeah, that's one of the with the cogeneration system that we have, it is very reliable. It does provide that second layer of energy and it does so in a pretty efficient way. Um, we know that long-term we wanna phase it out, but um, in the near term, it is providing a lot of additional reliability. So um, you know, we're earthquake country on top of it. So there's, there's just a lot of emphasis of, um, just that need for reliability. So we are uh, looking at things in the future. Um, we don't want to add a, a ton of uh, diesel fired generators. Obviously, I think Aaron, uh, Adam, Aaron might have touched on it earlier. You know, when we don't want to trade one for the other. I think there's some future looking that says, can we have batteries in some cases to provide short term power uh, bridging? But uh, that long, you know, when you have an extended outage, Currently, the cogen does something that no other technology that we have right now can do, which is power our campus for, you know, if there's an earthquake tomorrow, we're going to be on the cogen for the next however many days until the grid comes back. So, yeah, that's that's a very tough one for us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
related to this, um, I have a question for you, um, Professor um, Aaron. In in an op-ed you published in the SACB last June, you noted that less than 15% of energy uh, from UC comes from purchased electricity. However, you also can see that getting off the gas would be expensive. Um, are there models of research universities or universities or medical centers um, successfully electrifying their opera operations and obviously considering these reliability issues that Paul brought up? Yeah, well, we know the example of Stanford University and you might have invited someone from there to speak about that maybe next time, but they, uh, they retired their fossil infrastructure and they run you know, the whole thing on electric. Um, it's not clear what the resiliency issue is that so yes Stanford University is the example you know for a few hundred million dollars, you can do this. <laughs> and I wish our Chancellor would. Um, the resiliency issue uh, is often thrown out here as some great big impediment and I have some news on that front so one of the campus engineers looked into it and seems extremely confident and there's no regulatory issues, you can see that uh, the cogen plant could be retained as a backup the gas line can be maintained from the company. And if in the very unlikely event that might happen for a few days, every few years, that wildfires are so bad that our campus loses electric power, well, you fire up the cogen plant and run it on methane if you have to. You know, what, like what? No, I mean, why not, right? So um, I, I mean, that's an interesting question for the other panelists here. Like, you know, is this resiliency issue that's often thrown up as a great obstacle here really a serious problem or is this a red herring? Thank you. Would anyone like to comment on that? I think it, if I could comment, um, and also, Adam, I really appreciated your presentation because you reminded us of the urgency with which we really need to address decar um, decarbonization. Um, and I, I'm going to tie also to the question you posted in the chat about why are we talking about nuclear when we have renewables? But the urgency is so big that we need all of the solutions that we can possibly talk about to deploy them as fast as we can. And we're probably still not going to deploy them as fast as we need to. So I think it's it's not about or, it's about and. What can we bring to the table? Um, and then when it comes to, to reliability, um, I think um, this is, again, um, when we talk about nuclear, it's not about do we want nuclear or do we not want nuclear. Nuclear is an entire, it's a diverse set of technologies. It's, it's, it's just as diverse as with fossil fuel, we talk about internal combustion engines, we talk about jet engines on airplanes, we talk about diesel generators, and coal plants, gas plants, right? There's a diversity of products. And so similarly with nuclear, you have a diversity of products and you have to talk about what features do these products need to have we, do, we if we are going to put a plant that has high reliability or two plants so that they're redundant and diverse two very different plants that can withstand earthquakes and can withstand extreme weather events if we're going to put them under a hospital then what features do they need to have so that they're an acceptable technology and we need to look at the life cycle um you know the full life cycle not just the plant but where do the materials for the plant come from? How do you decommission this plant? Is this type of technology deployment reversible? Or are we going to deploy a technology that later we're going to realize that, oh, actually, we need to take it back. It wasn't a good idea. And so these types of principles of life cycle analysis can apply across the board to renewables, to nuclear. And then once you've defined what are the features of an acceptable technology, it's not about do we want nuclear, do we want solar, do we want wind? It's about how do we meet the needs of society? And then once those are defined, then the technologists can go back and say, can we meet this with nuclear? And in some cases, they'll say, no, we can't do this with nuclear. And in some cases, they'll say, yes, nuclear is, is a good solution. And we're going to work to modify this particular nuclear energy plant so that it meets the, re the reliability needs, the redundancy needs, the life cycle um, resource utilization needs, we're going to modify it so it meets those needs. So I think the conversation here um, can be had in a bit of a different way. Thank you. Uh, Norman, would you like to comment? 
Yes, uh, thank you. So unfortunately, I think the resiliency issue is real. Um, one thing we're seeing with the climate crisis is that uh, extreme weather events are more common and more severe than in the past. And so you look at winter storm Uri when ERCOT went down for a few days in parts of Texas and more than 150 people died. You look at um, the temperatures of over 115 degrees in the Pacific Northwest in, in summertime. You look at extreme rainstorms, um, extreme drought, uh, extreme snowfalls. And so I think, um, you know, part of the discussion regarding the response to the climate crisis is infrastructure uh, and whether it's going to be reliable and resilient in the face of, of that crisis. Uh, but of course, there are many other issues as well. But I, but I would say the resiliency issue is real. And so for a hospital to be thinking about what it needs to do for backup power uh, in the event of some sort of extreme weather event, I think that's the kind of planning they, they have to do. Professor Ron? Yeah, just briefly on that. I mean, sure, absolutely, of course, right? But so, I mean, I'm not a purist. Um, we can mostly run our campuses on electric power. And if there's an emergency, Norman and Gail and everyone else, all right, you have diesel generators. Is that the new hospital in Hillcrest? They're going to put diesel generators as backup and hopefully not use them all the time, but they'll use them. We'll burn fossil fuels if we have to, right? And, and I mean, they could... So resiliency is a real issue, but there's definitely solutions to resiliency. My worry is that resiliency concern keeps being brought up as a reason why we just have to keep burning frac methane on our campuses. That's my worry. And I wonder if people could address that issue. Like, uh, yeah, that's my question. Why, why do we keep coming back to this resiliency thing when we, when we concede that worst case scenario, you can run your campuses on fossil, fossil gas if you have to, but just don't do it all the time. Thank you very much. Um, I, we do need to move to, to another question. Um, so uh, moving, moving a little bit less from generation to behavior, how much of an impact would an education campaign have on sparing energy in all UC campuses by modifying human behavior? How much lower would the energy bill be if human users were to become less exuberant or perhaps uncaring in how energy is used, misused and abused? No impact, large impact, how much percentage wise? This is a question from Laura Hotel. Thank you. Uh, I can answer that. Uh, so we did a study many years ago, it would be worth revisiting, but there was an estimate of about 40% of uh, the energy is controlled by the occupants. So if the occupants were um, educated to know, you know, to turn off equipment, to turn off lights, to buy Energy Star uh, appliances versus non-Energy Star appliances, to buy uh, electric versus natural gas uh, appliances and, and equipment, um, that could make a difference. What we did find uh, during COVID, when uh, there was a sparse number of um, researchers on site in our laboratories, we still had to turn the whole building on for one or two people in the building. Uh, the whole ventilation systems had to be turned on to you know, keep, the, uh, keep the building running uh, because they weren't designed to be um, localized by floor or by department. Um, so that was one thing we we looked at how much money can we save with, you know, 20% of the um, campus occupants on site continuing to do research. And I believe we only saved maybe five to 10% of the energy use, even though we didn't have a lot of people on the building. Um, Paul, might you might wanna? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good point. I think we, you know, we're, we're um, lucky to be presenting in front of this group and I would, say um, if I'm just making a call for assistance on energy conservation, what can I ask? So I'd love to come with an ask, would be uh, keep an eye out for, particularly we're at a lab heavy um, campus, you know, efficient stuff, uh, efficient equipment as you're purchasing equipment, putting in the labs. And then um, I think we also have an opportunity because um, there's a number of lean projects going on that like combine uses of freezers. So instead of everybody having their own freezer, can we co-locate freezers? Can we put them in rooms where the heat gets exhausted so we don't have to 
use a ton of cooling. Um, some of those activities that can be done on a local level, you know, we, we like that those conversations are happening. Um, the other one is with COVID, I think the, the way the workforce works is changed and probably won't change back. So we have an opportunity there. So if you have an office building that has two people on each floor, could we say, hey, two of the floors are going to be shut down. We're going to concentrate on this one. You know, people are going to meet in these uh, close off of both floors. Sorry, I didn't articulate that right. But I mean, I think there is, as far as office space and uh, the way work is happening in buildings, we're not turning down as much as we should and could. So we've been pretty successful with energy saving, but I think there's just a lot more out there to get. Yeah, even uh, one example is during during the holidays where we can actually shut down buildings for two weeks. Um, but we get objections from staff saying, no, we, we want to be in there to do our research. We need to go in there to work because I don't want to take vacation. And then the whole building has to be turned on. So those are the kinds of things we could get if we could get support from our um, UCSF community to be more flexible in those areas, we could potentially save more energy. Thank you very much. Um, I have a, I have a question uh, that is in part directed to Mr. Bay, um, but, but please all comment. Um, different regions are more effective for producing certain types of renewable energy, such as solar, wind, than others. Um, thus, unless power can flow seamlessly across states and regions, some parts of the country may find electrification easier than others. How will California's geography help or hinder our efforts to move away from fossil fuels and toward renewable energy? Can UCSF source the renewable energy that we need to power the campus locally or regionally? If not, how easy is it to source renewable energy from longer distances currently? So that's a great question. Uh, clearly, different parts of the United States are more uh, rich uh, in renewables than others. Uh, California is lucky in that it's got abundant uh, sunshine, and so that's that's one of the reasons why you get you know the the belly of the duck in the in the load curve uh, during the day when the sun is shining. Um, now, uh, uh, what you need to see is energy storage that can capture some of that solar energy and shift the time when consumers use it uh, to, to the hours of the day when the sun isn't shining. Um, the other thing that could be happening off of California that's very exciting is offshore wind. Uh, the, the challenge though is that the California seabed drops pretty quickly, unlike the seabed on the East Coast. So it gets deep very quickly, which means you probably have to use floating turbine technology mm -hmm. Um, that has been developed and the costs are coming down as uh, more and more of that technology is being deployed around the world, but it's still more expensive than onshore wind, uh, PV solar, um, or uh, offshore wind on the East Coast. But that, but that could happen. So that's, that's another possibility. Um, the other thing I think that helps California is that uh, they have a cap and trade system so that in theory, the electricity coming into California the price is taking into account whether or not um, uh, the electricity is produced uh, um, using fossil fuels. Uh, so that can be helpful. But California is actually in a pretty good position. And because it's such an important market, there are lots of other Western states that, that are eager uh, to ship power to California when it's needed. Um, the best wind resources though, which would also complement the, the solar resources in California, if you don't have the offshore wind at least would be probably in like, I would say Montana, Wyoming and New Mexico. And so then you would have to build out the transmission uh, to get that um, electricity to California. But you know, on a very exciting note, there have been times for the California grid uh, where more than 80% of the demand is met by renewable energy. Uh, so this is really kind of, I mean like back in 2015 when I was still at FERC, there would be people coming in saying, you know what? We don't know if we can get to 30% renewables on our system. We're worried about the reliability of the system. And, and now, of course, we're seeing that in California, you can get to 80% plus uh, using available technologies. Uh, and so that's really, I think, an important takeaway for the audience today, that even using the toolkit we have now, you can drive pretty deep decarbonization uh, in a way that is also pretty reliable and that doesn't raise um, you know, costs for consumers. 
Thank you. Um, Gail, would you like to comment? No, I think I think um, Norman made a good point. Uh, I was wondering if there was a, a way to shift the load where the demand is um, throughout the country. So if we're generating it in California, could it be used on the East Coast when it's needed? Um, and I think that might be the, the challenge of moving power uh, across the country, right? We just don't have the infrastructure to do it or the regulatory um, clearance to do it. You know, I think that's a great point, Gail. There was actually a study um, that uh, concluded that if you had a fully developed grid, you wouldn't even need energy storage because you could balance out variability in load and also in weather, you know, mm -hmm. throughout the United States. So there's no doubt that having a, a built out grid uh, could be helpful, um, you know, while also continuing to support distributed energy resources like rooftop solar and the like. But but clearly having that infrastructure would be very helpful. It's just that building it is incredibly difficult. Thank you. Any others would like to comment? Okay. Um, we have some questions from the audience. Um, so from Maria Zlotnik um, to Gail and Paul, can we hire an energy waste ambassador who we could call to shut off energy wastage? We see um, lights on at night, unattended vampires. Um, obviously the, this gets to the question of the behavior piece, you know, versus the overall generation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, this is a great yes, idea if we could harness, we um, right, if, if we could harness a team, like a green team for every department who will be the person to walk through and, and turn things off. I think the challenge has been, and even this happened during COVID, is um, we'll, can we get permission from the departments to do it? And it, it became uh, a challenge to, to even turn off, we were thinking of turning off refrigerators in kitchens where there was nobody on, on site. And it, it just became um, very complicated because people would say, well, you know, what if I show up one day and want to put my lunch in the refrigerator? <laughs> it's turned off. So getting approval from the owners became the challenge. But I think if we turned it around and it had each department had a designated person as that, um, the, the monitor, that might be a, an opportunity because that would happen within their department and, and all of the people in, within that department would know about it. Yeah, I would say we can, we can do that. So we could start a campaign to, to try and push that. Yeah, and, and if, you, if, you, if you find stuff like that, you can actually email me personally and I'll figure out <laughs> how to do it. Uh, but yeah, we've done some of that too with our custodial team because they're here at night and when they're done with their work, um, you know, just encouraging them to turn up the lights and, and they're, they're very helpful in that regard. Probably time to do it again. All right, thank you very much. So uh, it's time to close our Q&A session for now. I wanna thank each and every one of you for your incredible expertise and for contrib contributing to this discussion. Um, I'm going to hand, hand uh, the mic back to, uh, to Steve. Thank you again to all of our speakers and uh, to the participants for what's really a very important topic and a very lively and dynamic discussion. It seems that the geography and the infrastructure of California and the know-how of the University of California can really make a big difference uh, as we move forward to solving the climate crisis. And perhaps uh, this discussion can move on to the other campuses so that we can have a coordinated approach. I'm gonna make one ask. Uh, before I do that, I wanna thank the uh, Academic Senate staff for putting this on because I absolutely don't know how to put on a webinar and highlight you know, the help of the entire staff, especially uh, Ken Laslavic, Liz Greenwood, um, Todd Geet and others. Uh, to help us make this better next time, I will ask that uh, you provide some feedback uh, and that can be done with a QR code that I will flash very soon. There will also be a link uh, to the chat uh, if you prefer that. So let me just share that screen. Thank you for coming and it's been a real pleasure.